done in your life. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I thank God for my mother because when I look at my mom, and she's the person that first told me about the Lord and shared the Lord with me, her and the uh, former first lady of this church, my aunt Josephine. And just to be able to see life at this point in your 60s, and I told my mom yesterday, you you don't understand what your parents do for you until you start running your own home and raising your own kids. And I'm trying to figure out how she raised five kids when my dad wasn't there hardly at all. And somehow or another, she made ends meet, able to keep us with a roof over our head, clothes on our back. I don't remember ever missing a meal. And the reason I don't, because I never missed a meal. But God is a faithful God. And so yesterday, I thank God because I realized that in my wife, I saw what was in my mother, a person that's compassionate and caring. Because, you know, men, we, we don't really organize stuff well. <laughs> and, and so I was trying to organize this party, and I had food out of my festive Christmas. Like, well, I don't know how you're going to do it. <laughs> Decorations have been put up. And so when I went out and got, by the time I got back, she had the whole house decorated. <laughs> I said, it must be a woman thing. <laughs> But I thank God for Pastor Crystal because uh, she, she made that day happen for my mom. And I always say that I feel sorry for mothers who don't have a good daughter-in-law. Because if you just got a son-in-law, sometimes you might be up a creek without a path. <laughs> but thank God for a daughter-in-law. Amen. 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 I pray that you had a good week this week. We had a great time this past Wednesday as we continue going through the book of Revelation. And I encourage you to join us by Zoom. As a matter of fact, um, the if you go to the church's Zoom uh, church's YouTube page, the Bible lesson from last week is out there on YouTube, and so you can go and get that. And then we'll have the pages up on the notes page as soon as I get this page squared away. We had the old notes up there, but I'm trying to put it in order so everything just runs based on what we did in chronological order. So those who come afterwards can go and actually see what we went through. Amen. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew 14, chapter verse 34 through 36. And it says, when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized them, they sent out into all that surrounding region, brought to him all who were sick, and begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many touched it, were made perfectly well. I want to preach this morning the idea of Christ-like ministry. Christ-like ministry. Let's pray. Father, thank you now for this time with we can come together and gather around your word we thank you for the praise and worship that is already going up we thank you father for each and every person that is gathered here in the sanctuary and on the zoom we ask now lord that you would give us receptive hearts ears and minds let, let your spirit speak to us father free me up in the spirit so that i might preach the word of god this morning we ask lord that you would have your way in our midst let no flesh glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. And our hearts say amen. amen. You know this story. Jesus has been preaching and teaching. John the Baptist was killed. Jesus left and went up into a place to be by himself to pray. A multitude gathered. Jesus came. He taught and then he fed them. There were 5,000 people. Then Jesus sent his disciples on a boat over to the other side of Lake Genesaret. A storm broke out, or the scripture says that uh, a contrary wind. And last week, Peter got out the boat, walked on water for a few minutes, stopped looking at Jesus and sang. And then the scripture says when Jesus got back into the boat, that the winds subsided. 
as soon as he stepped into the boat. And they finally cross over to the other side when we come to this text. Now, what you need to understand that this couple of verses, these three verses, are actually a bridge in the chronological order that Matthew was telling you about the life of Jesus Christ. And it might seem like there's not much here in these three verses, but we believe that there's something that we can gain from just these three verses as we talk about Christ-like ministry. You see, they came across the other side and they had to be weary and tired. I mean, they were in a storm. There was a point where they probably thought they were going to die. But now in the midst of that storm, remember Jesus walked on board to them, told Peter that he had little faith. If he had had more faith, he would have been able to continue to walk on the water. And then they realized in that moment, the disciples said they knew that he was the son of God. In other words, they had an eye-opening experience. They had this experience with Jesus that they saw him in another light, in another perspective. They saw him as more than just the person that they had been traveling with, they had been teaching. As a matter of fact, I think when they saw Jesus in that moment, his teaching took on a whole nother dimension because they realized what he was trying to teach them was something that was valid and life-changing and something that would change their destiny. They realized in that moment that what Jesus was trying to do was make them a part of something that had never happened before. That what looked like Jesus being at odds against the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees was actually something new that God was about to do. Now we sit in this timeline and we know that it was when God was beginning to start the development of the church. And so the disciples come with him and they come to the other side. The scripture tells us this morning that when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Genesaret, this nice, lovely community. But what happened is when Jesus arrived, it says that the men recognized Jesus. They recognized that this was the man that had been healing people. This was the man that had been talked about, who had wisdom and knowledge. But the main thing they focused on was what? That he was healing people. And we know that because not only did they recognize Jesus, they recognized what he could do. There's one thing when somebody recognizes you, but then there's another thing when they recognize it beyond just your appearance, but your ability and your capacity to do something. In other words, you go to your doctor because you recognize that he's your doctor, but then some people, when you recognize that your doctor has been to school, has been educated, has studied and prepared, so that when you come in there with that bump on your arm, he sees it and he recognizes it what it is. Now, if you recognize that he's more than just your doctor, but he's somebody that's there to treat you, wow. you follow his advice. You yes. go to the pharmacy and you get your prescription and you take it. You go to physical therapy when he tells you to go to physical therapy because you recognize that he's more than just the name on the door, but he's your doctor, the person that has the ability to give you direction that will help you physically. Well, so these men, they recognize Jesus. And what do they do? They organize an outreach. The scripture says that they sent out into all the surrounding region to let people know that Jesus was there. They put the word out that Jesus was in town. They put the word out that Jesus was there and the emphasis was not on his teaching so much. The emphasis was to come out because Jesus could heal them. The scripture says that people brought to him all who were sick. In other words, the word came out that Jesus, the healer, was in town. Jesus, the one who had touched, the woman had touched the hem of his garment and been healed from the issue of blood, that this man was in town. He had just come in on a boat. The scripture says they brought to them all who were sick. 
I imagine if they had hospitals, they emptied the hospital beds. Wherever they had sick people in their homes, they brought them out. They made an exodus from wherever they were to get to Jesus. And not only did they come there, but it says that they begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. They just begged them. Now, the hem of his garment was partly what the Jewish men wore. They had to wear tassels. That was part of their tradition. The tassels were part of what they were instructed to do. And they would have these tassels on four corners of their garment. And that's what the people wanted to touch. They wanted to touch these tassels because they felt there would be healing if they touched the tassels that were on Jesus. I want us to look at three things because this verse speaks volumes about Jesus doing ministry. You see, we talked a week ago about God wants to do something for us, in us, and through us. The problem is we usually get stuck on all I want to know about is what God wants to do for me. We just want to focus on, you know, can God get that new car for me? Can God give me a new job? See, because what God can do for me makes God become like the genie in the bottle or holy Santa Claus, where I just make a wish list. I bring it to church and I tell people, pray for my wish list. And all I'm focused about is what can Jesus do for me? And that's not ministry. You see, because if the church simply becomes a place where people come so that they can figure out what Jesus can do for them and not focus on what he can do in them and through them, then we've missed the point. And what happened in this story as we go through, you're going to see that the people were simply coming to Jesus for what he could do for them. Maybe what he could do in them physically, but there was no desire for a, phys a spiritual change. There was no desire for a spiritual impact to happen in their life. There was no desire to go from the place with their healing and to do what Jesus was doing, which was to spread the word and the gospel about the kingdom of God. And so we have in our lives times where we simply focus on what can God do for me or what have you done for me lately, God? Well, the first thing I want us to understand is this, that we see in our society that when celebrities come into our town, people flock there. Uh, if you ever go to like basketball games, you know, young people, they love the basketball players. Uh, when we go to the game, there's a section where the players come in and out the tunnel. And young kids will be there, they'll have their sneakers, they'll have their books, they'll have their posters, t-shirts. They just want to get an autograph. And they'll be hanging out there and they'll be yelling their name and the players got to go focus on the game. Every now and then they'll just, you know, wave to them. But most times they're not even paying attention to the kids. The kids are just going crazy. Jesus was in the same situation. You see, he gets off the boat. But I want to tell you that the first point was we want to look at the pity he exhibited. Pity. Jesus gets out of the boat right where people can meet him. You see, when he landed the boat, they could have always done like people would do. Let's go to a different shore where there's not going to be a crowd. Or as the boat pulls in, you start seeing that there's a crowd building near that space. So you turn your boat in another direction to head to another location where it's less confining and people don't know where you're coming in at. He didn't try to land his boat on the cup because he had pity for the people. He, was, he had a sympathetic spirit because he saw these people gathering. And remember, we said that is the thing about Jesus. He never ran away from the multitude. He got away to pray, but he would wade right into the multitude and meet people head on right where they were. You see, as he got 
off the boat and he realized that people were coming for a healing, he was sympathetic to their pain and suffering. Sometimes we find ourselves unsympathetic to people's pain and suffering. You, know, you ever have a moment where a person catch you on a day where like, you know, you just worried about you. And it's like, I hear you, but I don't hear you because I got my own problems. But Jesus never was like that. He, he was sympathetic to their pain and their suffering. In other words, there was nobody whose issue was too small for him. If somebody was in that crowd and all they had was a splinter in their finger, that was fine with Jesus. He would heal them. They could touch the hem of his garment. But pity is what motivated him to wade into the crowd. How he saw people and how he felt about people enabled him to do that. We need to look at ourselves and see how much pity do we have for people. Is it my lack of empathy and sympathy for people that makes me just not interact with people when they're facing their difficult moments, yeah. that I can hear somebody say, pray for me. And I'll say, I'll pray for you, but I don't pray for you. I'll hear somebody say, hey, could you just call me every now and then, but I'm too busy with my life. So the pity he exhibited, you, you know, when you see these crowds of athletes and celebrities, sometimes there is no pity. <laughs> They never had pity for people that had been waiting all day long to see them. They just go right on in. They don't even acknowledge them. I always say that because my mom was a person that loved history. So this one evening we come home from school and she says, we're going up to Broad Street because the president's going to be coming by. And this was when Lyndon Johnson became president. So we go up to Broad Street and, you know, as a kid, you're thinking that the president's actually going to get out the car or something. But I was kind of suspect because the other president had been assassinated already. So I, I was wondering how this was going to work out. All I remember was we were going to see the president and we're standing at Broad Street. And I guess the motorcade went by at about 65 miles an hour up Broad Street. And you were trying to figure which one was the president because, you know, four men were standing on the car. You couldn't see in the window. All you could tell your friends, oh, we, we wasn't saw the president yesterday. He didn't have any pity on the people that was out there waiting all afternoon to see him. He was on his way to wherever he was going. And a lot of times we're like the president. We're busy in our self-motorcade. And my self-motorcade has got to get where it's going. And you got to get out of my way. I don't have time to hear you in your situation. I'll get back to you later if I can. The second thing is this. His patience he portrayed. The patience he portrayed. He gets off of a boat. They've been out all night. He's been praying. He walked on water, helped Peter get out the water, got on the boat and stopped the storm, pulled in the shore. All these people come out and they want to be healed and the scripture says he took time out as many as touched him were made perfect he took time out so that many could touch him he took time out so many could get close to him he took time out so that people could interact with him He took time out so that people got what they wanted. And he never refused them. As a matter of fact, the interesting thing about this portion of scripture here is there was no preaching or teaching, just healing. It kind of reminds me of when I used to go to the revivals and they would have the last night of revival and it would be healing night. And they would sing and they would just have a prayer line. And this is how it was with Jesus that they did with no five praise and worship songs. There was no sermon, no offering taken, just Jesus there allowing people to just touch the hem of his garment. Jesus there just interacting with people. Can you, can you see this multitude of people around? You see, because most people don't want to be around sick people. Most people don't even want to go into a hospital. 
But can you imagine going into a place and you see all these sicknesses, all the deformity, and you have to think you're in a culture where there's no medical pr practice of what we're expecting today. There's the technology and the, the, the ability to heal people and heal sickness has not arrived yet. And Jesus looks into all this hurt and this pain and this sorrow. And you know what he sees? He sees the effects of what sin has done to mankind. Because God has fearfully, and we said wonderfully made us, he made us to be in fellowship with him. And this was a perfect world when he made it. But the fall brought sin and sin brought death. And death shows itself up in many ways, mainly through sickness. Because it is the process of sickness that allows death to overtake us. And here Jesus was in the midst of this crowd, allowing people to just touch him, making himself accessible. William Barclay says this, that Jesus taught men and women what God was like by showing them what God was like. He taught men and women what God was like by showing them what God was like. How much teaching are we doing with our lives? How much are we standing in the midst of our community, in the midst of our family, in the midst of our homes, where people may be hurting and suffering and they are spiritually sick and we're just simply letting them touch the hem of our heart. They're just able to touch and, and receive what God is doing in us, just spilling over into them. You see, he didn't tell people that God cares. Jesus showed people that God cares. There's one thing to tell somebody, man, God really cares about you. God, God really loves you, but you never show them love. That's the sad thing about Christianity is that if we always only talk about what God is, but never show what God is, people will never know who God is. And how can they want to follow a God who they don't know? Jesus was patient he portrayed patience as he stood in the midst of the people and made himself accessible but the third thing was this it was the power he displayed the power that he displayed it says that they brought all to him that they might touch the hem of his garment and as many touched it were made perfectly well Is the power of God evident in our lives? You see, that's what I'm talking about when we talk about God doing something for us, in us, and through us. If we just stop at what God is doing for me, and we don't allow him to do something in us, how can he do something through us? Because it has to be a display and evidence of God's power working in our lives. God is not asking us to take what we have. He's saying, give me what you have, what I gave you. Put it in my hands and I can do something with it. Turn your life over to me and I can do something magnificent that you can't even imagine. Allow me to change you and conform you into my image. That's where the power comes in. That's what allows you to stand in the midst of a sin-darkened world. And even though you want to run and get away from the anguish and the hurt and the pain and the suffering that you see around you, you stay right there in the midst because you know that God has put an anointing on you, this spirit on you, that if they would simply just tap into what God is doing in your life, that it can change and revolutionize their life. I know what that's about because that's what I've seen in my mother's life. The power of God, the power. That's how I learned the power of prayer. That's how I learned how to pray by faith because I saw her praying by faith. I saw what faith will do for you. I saw her walk by faith. And what 
Don is saying that if you allow me to do something in you, I'm going to do something through you. I'm going to do something through that you that you have never imagined, that you couldn't imagine. I don't care where you are right now in your Christian walk, in your Christian faith, in your life's journey. It is never too late for God to do something in your life and through your life. If you will allow me. Because the best years of what God can do for you are right now if you will simply just turn your life over to him. And I'm talking about believers, too. If we will fully surrender, because there's a difference between saying Jesus is my Savior and Jesus is my Lord. If he's my Savior, yes, he saved me from sin and the penalty of sin. But if he is my Lord, that means that everything that I do, I'm going to check with him first before I do there's no moves that I'm going to be making without him giving me advice and direction and leadership and encouragement. But that's where most people get mixed up. They don't want him to be their Lord. They want him to be in a partnership with them. God wants to be in control. So the question we have to ask ourselves is this. What do people recognize about you? I mean, the people, when Jesus got off the boat, they recognized him. They recognized who he was. They recognized what he could do. The sad thing is this. Jesus gets off the boat. They recognize him. The disciples are in an experience where they recognize what he can do. And they recognize who he is. The people on the shore recognize what he can do, but don't have an understanding of who he is. They have not begun to grasp who he is, that he is the son of God. And so the question is, do people recognize the God in you? Do they recognize the power of God? In you? And when people see you, do they see you as a person that as patient with people who are far from God? Do they see you as a person who is willing to be right there in the midst of them and be patient while they work their soul salvation out? Sometimes we give up on people too fast. Gave them the gospel, told them about Jesus. They didn't get saved. They on their own now. If they don't make it, I told them. That's not how God treats says, you know why? Because the Bible says, what? Well, behold, I stand at the door of what? And knock. That's a knock with a plural. A plural of it. It's not like I came to the door and I knocked. You didn't open up and I went on about my business. Jesus is knocking. He knocked for us. He expects us to do the same for others. To just be there constantly. Giving them an opportunity for God to do something for them that they can't imagine and then allowing them to understand what it means for God to do something in them. And then the joy of, of seeing God do something through them because you were faithful in doing what God asked you to do. Amen. Jesus got off a boat, tired, weary, all night with a storm, all night teaching his disciples, trying to show them what faith was and trying to reveal to them the limitation of the faith they thought they had. Stop the storm, gets off the boat and wades into a crowd of people and just said, I'm gonna just let God do something in them while he does something through me. Can you wade into the crowd? Can you wade into this world that we live in and allow God to do something and people through you? Yeah. Or are you just waiting for them to just find Jesus on their own? Mm -hmm. You see, that's why we talk and say this is Christ-like ministry. Because it's ministry where you have to give of yourself. Mm -hmm. Jesus was willing to go the full nine yards. He was willing to give up his life. He was willing to sacrifice his life 
he waded into the crowd in that moment, but then he went all the way to the cross. He allowed the crowd to say crucify him, and he didn't back down. He allowed the crowd to accuse him of being a sinner. He allowed the crowd to put him on a cross and make him die a death that was a disgraceful death. He was willing to let them take his life, but they didn't take his life. He laid his life down. Just like he stepped off the boat and stepped into the crowd, he stepped right into the jaws of death so that he could give us eternal life. But he got up early that Sunday morning with all power in his hand. He got up with power so that he could do something in us. And through us, he had already done the for us. Now he's just saying, if you let me, I want to do something in you. I know you, I know you might be in your 70s, but I want to do something through you. I know you might be in your 80s. I'm on, I know you might think that you've done all that you're going to do, but I got something just a little more that I want you to do. We should not be like some folks, like I'm retired. I'm a retired Christian. I'm just waiting for God to take me to glory. No, we should be occupying until he comes again. The scripture says, I must work the work of him who called me for his night cometh when no man could work. We still got work to do. We still need to wade into the crowd. Just let them get a taste of who Jesus is. Just let them get a touch of his glory, a touch of his might and his majesty. Just, just a bit of the power that is available. You see, God brought you out of some stuff just so you could tell somebody, oh, he can do it. Amen. God brought you through some situations so you can tell people, oh, it's possible. Don't sleep on Jesus because he will do it if you will just, just trust him. Amen. And people need to know that. Amen. Just like we live in this world now and people think it's hopeless and yeah. Well, yeah, the Bible just said in the last days what men would be, but that means it's opportunity for us to go out there and change people because it didn't say that in the last days all men, because as long as Jesus is offering salvation, some men, some women, some boys, some girl will walk from the kingdom of darkness into his marvelous light. Oh, yeah. Amen. Oh, yeah. How many people have walked into his marvelous light because you were willing to wade into the crowd? Oh, willing to step off that boat? Willing to say, you know what? I know I want to take, take and row this boat around to you know the other side of the Delaware so I have to deal with these people. I can go over there and get out of Cape May. Ain't nobody really down there. I can just relax. But not you. You waded right down into Center City, Philadelphia, at Penn's Landing on the Fourth of July. It said, "God, whatever you want to do, I'm going to step into the crowd, and I'm going to let you do something in me and through me, so that you can do something for them that they can't imagine." Christ-like ministry means that we have to do ministry like Christ. Yeah. We don't make it up on our own, but we make it up according to what he did. And that's the beauty as we go through Matthew. We're seeing more and more what Jesus was about. How he was really about people and how he could minister to people. So we go to the text, not just looking at, oh, I just want to touch the hem of his garment. But Lord, put some garments on me. Put something on me that somebody can touch. Put something in me so that somebody can reach out and experience God. I don't want it to just be me touching you. I want it to be you putting something in, in me that somebody can touch and experience you because I was here. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his love and his display of pity and patience and power. Thank you, Lord, because we know that you called us to wade into the crowd. And now, Lord, we ask, give us the boldness, give us the faith to wade into the crowd so that people can touch and experience God, so that people can reach out and know about your power and your grace and your mercy. 
I pray, Lord, that whoever is under the sound of my voice that doesn't know Jesus as the Savior, that they would reach out even now and ask the Savior to save them because he's calling out to them even now. This we ask in Jesus' name with thanksgiving and our hearts say amen. amen. You might be here via Zoom or in the building. If you have never accepted Christ as Savior, we extend you an invitation. As we told you, Jesus came into this world and went all the way to town, laid down his life so that we would be free from sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus said that if you would believe that he came, died for sin, and he rose again, that you can be saved. If you're here and you've never accepted Christ as Savior, we extend to your invitation to accept Christ as Savior now. Secondly, if you're here and you don't have a church home where you can worship and study the Word of God and be under the direction of godly pastorship, we're not a perfect church, but we serve a perfect God, and we extend you an invitation to be part of the fellowship here at the Bible Baptist Church. If there's one, we give an invitation as our invitation song is sung. As we not hold yet the same, Continue to draw them to. They might realize that there is a life that you have for them that will be a whole new life, a brand new life in Christ Jesus. Then we pray, Father, for those that are seeking a church home and a church family that you would speak to them. This we ask in Jesus' name and thanksgiving in our hearts. Amen. Amen. I'd like to pray for. Uh, who is in need of a touch from God. Father, I pray for each and every member of this congregation who is in need of a touch or knows someone who is in need of a touch. When they leave out today and they pray for their family members, friends, co-workers, neighbors, Father, I ask that it would be like the them wearing your garment and that their prayers would just carry through and that you would provide the touch. God, we just thank you that we know that prayer is powerful. That when you reach out to you for someone else, that you hear the prayers. So Father, I ask that you would move in a mighty way on behalf of this person, on behalf of each and every person that we know needs the touch from Satan. Yeah. In God's name, Name of Jesus, Amen. Amen. I pray that you have 
had a blessed experience here in the worship service today. Yes. I 